Good evening, everyone. This is Nathan Hayes from Prima. Thank you for joining us tonight for our uh, one of our favorite topics, how to love vision plans, or at least like them a little. Uh, Dr. Gelmore is going to take over in just a minute, but as a reminder for the format, everyone is in listen-only mode. If you have questions along the way, use the question section and type them in. Um, I may answer it quickly if it's something simple, or we'll have an open forum of questions at the end. So just use that section, and we, we really enjoy having a dialogue at the end of these presentations with that. So um, that's the, the very brief announcements to start us off, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Gelmard. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks, Nathan. I appreciate that. Nice to be with you all this evening. And um, an interesting topic, an exciting topic, I think, one that I like a lot, so I'm looking forward to presenting this uh, with you. I think most of you know me already. These webinars are for PRIMA members only, so um, I'm sure we generally know each other. Uh, just to remind you, um, I do own and operate a practice in Munster, Indiana, which is near Chicago. My wife, Susan, is an optometrist, and she and I own the practice. We have three full-time optometrists, associate uh, employed ODs, and we have a staff of about 30 um, employees there. So getting on with our topic, well, it is controversial. I'm, I'm very well aware of the somewhat hard feelings we all share as independent private practice owners and independent optometrists. You know, vision plans are certainly not our favorite uh, uh, type of company, and uh, I'm aware of that and aware of the, you know, the, the sometimes the feelings that go with it. Um, but we're going to kind of dig into this topic and see and, and try to look at it from a non-emotional point of view. Uh, please text your questions. I greatly appreciate them. I'm going to keep my talk to 40 minutes or less, but I have got a lot of content, so I'll move a little bit quickly. You can always uh, log back in after tomorrow, and the uh, slides will be posted on the Prima website. In fact, the whole recording of this webinar will be posted, so you can review it, but I'm going to move it along fairly quickly. Uh, if you don't get a chance to, um, if I don't get to answer your question tonight um, live, please email it to me, and I'm happy to continue the uh, dialogue about that. Also, a little disclaimer, because... I'm going to present some new ideas tonight that I have not included in this lecture in bigger venues like Vision Expo. And uh, this is a little more private venue, which is good. So there's a few things in here that are, um, you know, interesting and uh, maybe a little bit innovative. Uh, certainly, though, I do want a disclaimer that mm, sometimes we push the borderline of what's legal to do with vision plans, and you always want to honor at your contract and refer to your provider manual. Some of the strategies I'm going to talk about may not be allowed by some vision plans, so I'll give you that disclaimer and leave it up to you to, uh, to check that out. Okay, so it's an emotional topic. Should you belong to vision plans as a provider? Should we, you know, not participate in some of their programs? In general, we're, I'm going to try to address some of that tonight, but I think we should remove the emotion. We should try to work on fact and, you know, data and truth. And sometimes that's a little hard to find. Vision plan regulations are complicated, and um, I study them and try to learn from them, and I accept all of them in my practice. So we're working on them every day, just like you are, for those of you that take some of them. And so, um, you know, let's remove the emotion and try to work on facts. And, and I will say, as I read the chat rooms and I talk to optometrists around the country, there's a lot of misconceptions. I mean, whether we like vision plans or hate them, we, there, there are misconceptions about what we believe to be the, you know, the regulations and, and even the profitability. I'll say that I don't make a blanket statement that all, all practices should accept vision plans or they should not accept any vision plans. It's a very individual decision. Every practice is unique. I'll try to help you reach the right decision for your practice, but every market is different. Every practice need is different, and sometimes some vision plans are good and others are not, so there's no blanket policy on what to do about vision plans. I think you should look at your appointment schedule, not just the fee schedule, and think about filling the appointment schedule and how are you doing with that. How's that going for you? Um, are you able to keep it full? Are you booked solid a good week in advance? Do you want to bring in an associate optometrist? Maybe you have one now, 
and he or she is not as busy as you'd like. Maybe you're going to bring one in in the near future. That would influence my decision with you about vision plans. You know, think about how else do you bring patients into your practice? How do you fill your appointment schedule? And, you know, we generally are going to look to marketing. And marketing is important, and we should do it. And we try a lot of new marketing techniques in my practice and at Prima. But how effective are those marketing projects? And, you know, a lot of them, in my experience, aren't that great. Uh, sometimes we break even on projects. And sometimes they take a long time. I mean, the word of mouth marketing takes a long time. How permanent is it? Maybe it's quick and over. And so in addition to marketing, vision plans are another source of patience, and we need to look at it. So it's an individual decision, and as you face your own decisions about any plans, ask yourself, are you making the decisions for what reason? What is the goal of your thinking? And I hear many times the resistance to participating in a vision plan is altruistic. It's for the good of optometry. And while I applaud that, I'm not so sure that that's working, that you or me not doing, our, not having our practice participate. Maybe it's the principle. And, you know, that is certainly I respect that, you know, for you, that you just won't do it on principle. But maybe we also want to make decisions, and I, as your consultant, make decisions on what's good for your practice, what's good for your business, what's good for your revenue and profit and income. And by the way, how, how well do you understand your profitability with the various vision plans? Whether you take it now or whether you're thinking about accepting one, it's pretty hard to understand the profitability. Most doctors don't know. And I'm going to show you today, and maybe you're familiar with my technique, for what I think is the only way to know how profitable vision plans are. So we're going to get to that. Okay, trying to move it on. Decisions, on, decisions about accepting a plan are difficult if you just look at the fee schedule. And most of us just look at the exam fee. And that alone would scare, scare all of us away. There's really more to vision plan profitability than just the exam fee. The exam fee happens to be the one thing that's easy to look at and easy to understand. But, and the rest of it's complicated. In my opinion, the only way to know about the fees and profit of a vision plan is to accept the vision plan, become a provider, which is a process, and work with the plan for maybe 60 days or 90 days, and then look retroactively back at your cases and see how you're doing and see what the profit really was. I, I, I am not able to look at a new vision plan's fee schedule and tell much about it. Um, there's too many unknowns. As you're thinking about vision plans, I stress the patient demand factor. Um, all good things come from lots of patient demand. Nothing really good in your practice flows without strong patient demand. And most optometrists don't have enough patient demand. Hopefully you're one of the exceptions, maybe you do, but even in my practice, and I think we have pretty strong demand for a single location office and, and high production and high revenue, I'm always looking for how do we see more patients? Where are the patients coming from? It's a, it's a big part of what I look at. So we need to adjust our thinking about what is the norm for patient demands and how many patients per day should we see? How many patients per day do we ex expect our associate doctors to see? And I think it's more than it used to be. The, the, the number of patients that we need to see is increasing. In order, with, with all kinds of managed care, and whether it's vision plans or not, whether it's downward pressure on profitability that we're experiencing, we need to find a way to um, see more patients and see them efficiently. So there's the sentiment that, that we hear out there, or read in the chat rooms, that VSP was started by optometrists, and if only we'd never joined them, if only we didn't do that. Or if only optometrists would all simultaneously drop the vision plans. Wouldn't that be great? And it would be great, but to me it's like it's not going to help us. It doesn't get us anywhere. It's not going to happen. Even as much as we might like the movements, I share the wishes that vision plans weren't so, pow so powerful, but, but um, they are powerful, and I don't see that really changing. 
I shouldn't say it won't change. We've seen some evidence of it changing in some states like Georgia, and Texas, and there are others. And I applaud that and support that. And going through the legislature or going through the AOA or going through the AADO or the state association or lawsuits or the court system or legislation, those are good avenues for us to follow, not simply saying I'm not going to let my practice be part of it. And we could do both. I think you could be in the pro, in a, be a provider and still fight the fight the system that maybe isn't fair. We have to say if we're just one practice, BSP has over 70 million members and 20,000 providers. We're not going to make a difference. Not not one, a one practice doesn't matter to them. So I have to do what's best for my practice. And as your consultant, I I'm going to advise you on what's best for you. We, sometimes we have to play the hand we're dealt, and um, we're dealt this system of vision plans. Let's be a little bit open and objective and fair and say, are there any good things about vision plans? I think we all know the bad. Uh, I will say, we do see patients continuing to see us on a regular basis because they have a vision plan. Maybe the fees are low, and, and not no maybe about it, they are. They're terribly low. We haven't had a raise in... 30 years, I don't think, by, for most of these plans in our fees. But, but still, we're going to look at profitability in a minute. And it does keep, the good part is, the patients do keep coming in on a regular basis. And during tougher economic times, and we are maybe recovering slowly, but there's still some areas of the country that are struggling, we still see patients. The movement by Warby Parker is very interesting to me. Very interested in, could this become a real trend and downward pressure on fees and prices. And if so, and I think it could be, um, vision plans will help insulate us against that because patients are less sensitive to our fees because they're not paying most of it. And we can still have a high fee because the patient doesn't really pay it. E-commerce is growing. That's another form of competition that we are concerned about. And vision plans still drive patients into our offices. So we see them first which is a huge advantage. And I think we have every reason to think our optical sales can stay quite strong. We may have to modify our policies and our pricing a little bit, but I see every reason to think we're in good shape with that. So vision plans have some good. Quickly then to keep moving, chair cost is not enough. If you look at chair cost, which is the um, fixed costs for your practice, not your cost of goods, which is variable, but the fixed cost divided by the number of patients you see or divided by the number of hours you're in the clinic and that's your chair cost. And it's not enough because it doesn't talk about your marginal cost. And by that I mean if your appointment schedule is not full, if your appointment schedule is not full, it, then you, the, what is the additional cost to see one more patient? And the additional cost is zero because you already have a staff, you're already paying your rent, you already have your equipment, and you have an empty appointment slot. Or maybe you've designed your appointments to only take 12 or 15 a day. In that case, I don't think you're seeing enough, and you should be seeing 25 a day, and you have 10 empty slots, because you're not, you're, you don't have enough. You haven't, you haven't set it up properly. So in those cases, you could see an additional patient and there's no cost to seeing that person. So any profit is better than no profit. So let's look at facts. We've become somewhat skeptical, a little cynical. We sometimes believe things that people say on a chat forum and we don't even know who they are. I'll tell you, sometimes I look up the doctors who I don't know who they are either and I'll just do a little Google search and they don't have a website. They don't, some of the most outspoken ones don't have a practice. I sometimes say, well, how can I, you know, what do they have to say? Where, where are they? And so, anyway, let's remove the myths, the inaccuracies, and the emotion. Okay, so I do recommend you analyze your profit margin. And by doing that, I'd say do each vision plan that you accept separately. Now, you have to actually be a provider to do this. And if you're curious about a plan, and maybe there's a plan that's popular in your market, I'd say join the plan, become a provider. You can always drop out if you hate it. And then, and then after a few months, go back and do what I'm going to tell you to do right here. 
and, and, and it's because you need to know your profit margin. Basically, it's simple. You pull 20 cases over a period of time, and I'm going to show you in a moment that you need to select cases that have the right category of sale, whether they're exam only, exam and glasses, maybe a small percentage would be exam and two pairs of glasses, exam and contacts. We need to know, we need to pick a correctly prorated share of all those types. From purposes of this little study that I want you to do, this profit analysis, let's move medical eye care out of this. This is just for the for vision plans, just for routine care. You should include in your profit analysis additional things that aren't covered, like retinal photo screenings, second pairs of glasses, everything that you sold, but not medical eye care that was built medically. When I did this, and I did it for all my plans, this is the prorated percentages that I used. I would make, out of my 20 cases, I made two cases exam only. I made 12 cases, or 60% of them, exam in glasses. And, and you can see on this chart, you know, how I did it. Other than that, it's very random. I didn't try to pick the, the highly paid cases or the low cases. I just picked, in fact, I just had my insurance coordinator pull cases randomly, as long as she got this prorated ruling. And if you don't think this mirrors your practice th properly, then change any of it that you feel you should to make it reflect your practice as a whole. In my practice, this is pretty close. All you have to do then is add up your payments for each of those 20 cases. You could just do it on a pad of paper. Show the total payments from all sources. From the vision plan, what did the plan pay? What did the patient pay out of pocket? It's on your ledger. It's on your computer system. We just have to add it up. Then deduct any cost of goods, because I'm going to look at gross profit. The only fair way is after cost of goods, some of which the company, the vision plan, has already deducted as a chargeback. And if they've already deducted it, then don't worry about it. If it's like Spectera and they make you write them a check at the end of the month, then you should deduct that. In other words, I want it after chargebacks, so make sure you're looking at your you know, EOBs from the vision plans properly. And if it's, a, if it's a vision plan where you do your own lab work, like VSP Choice, and you send it to your own lab, and you're paying the lab bill, then I want you to deduct those costs. And if you supplied the contacts, you deduct those costs. In other words, for these 20 cases, you have to see what were your cost of goods and deduct that from the payments you received. Okay, that's all. Show all your payments from all sources. Deduct all the chargebacks and cost of goods. Make sure you only deduct them once. That's it. The gross profit on each of these cases is the, uh, is the total of all payments, less cost of goods. Add up the gross profit on each of these 20 patients and divide by 20 for your mean gross profit per patient for VSP, for IMED, for Davis, for whatever you take. You could compare this, uh, basically consider if this profit is better than nothing because I'm going to assume you have some empty slots. If you don't have any empty slots and your book's solid, then I'm going to assume you're about to hire an associate OD and you're going to need more patients to fill the associate schedule. So that's my assumption. Here's, where, here's my profit profitability with the major vision plans. Spectera came in at the worst, but even with Spectera, on average, my practice is making $170 profit, gross profit per patient. That's after cost of goods. That's not that bad. I'd take that over an empty exam slot any day of the week. It's on, the, on an average. It's not bad. I'd like you to tell me what yours was. And if we're doing it much differently, we'll compare notes. Davis was a little better at 219. VSP Signature Interesting, we were so upset before when we had to take VSP Choice, which I wasn't because I was already taking VSP Choice, but a, a year or two ago they mandated that. We're actually making more money on VSP Choice than we do on Signature. Not much, and this is somewhat randomized. I mean, if I did it again, I'd get a little different number. So, you know, I agree that the data is not perfect here. But it gives you a, at least some feeling for what this was. So, in my opinion, we make more on optical on the Choice plan and a little less on the exam fee. The IMED also is about the same as VSP on profitability, 
usually IMED exam fees are lower, embarrassingly low, although they are coming up a little bit now, from a terrible $40 to maybe $50. But VSP is still more like $65 or $70. So still bad. My exam fee in my office for all kinds, routine or medical, is $179. It's a huge discount. Nevertheless, IMED is at 313 on the old model, and then for a couple months I was on the new network model using the network lab system. We did just as well profit-wise. I know it, many optometrists dropped out of IMED over the new lab network model. I don't know if it was good or bad for them, but the profitability is about the same in my office. Interesting stuff. You should do it on your. You should do it on your in your plans. Just. Have your staff pull, the, pull 20 cases and analyze it. If you do it, email me what your results are. I'd love to see it. Okay, in the little bit of time we have left, keep an eye on the clock for us today because I want to get to questions, I'm going to move through 14 strategies to increase profitability with vision plans. It's a lot, so we'll move along through it. Number one, see more exams per day. That's not as bad as it sounds. We have to move towards that in the new healthcare economy. We can do it without stress. We may have to hire more staff, and I view that as a good thing. We're going to delegate more. We're going to use technology. We're going to change our exam paradigm to speed things up. And patients actually like it, to tell you the truth. Um, we're still going to do a very thorough exam, don't get me wrong. But your technicians can do more of it. You may want to not talk quite as long to every patient. We just have to reinvent how we do high-quality eye care. This is a great way to increase profit, even with vision plans, because they, they pay you by the exam, not by the minute, and not by the hour. And you should compress your appointments into fewer days. You know, see the same number of patients in a half a day less or a full day less. Compress them. See more patients per day, and then have some management days or some days off, if you wish, but some days that you don't see patients. Some basic things, shorten tests, speed up tests, eliminate tests. You must have two exam rooms per doctor, and you must have pre-test rooms, more than one. And the ultimate delegation is hiring an associate OD. After you're very well delegated to technicians, I mean, let's hire technicians first and use them at their maximum and let the current doctors function at a high level. But then it, once you can stay busy with that, this is a great step, hire an associate OD. Number two, the medical model. Well, having a vision plan gives you access to the patient, access you may not have had. I don't care how good your practice is, you're going to struggle attracting vision plan patients out of network. You might get a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of my practice, but we, when we accept a new vision plan, it is all of a sudden we – the community is aware of it, and we see those patients, and we weren't seeing them before. So it's it, it, it generally true. We, we Now, what do you do once you see the patient? Many times, you know, vision plans only cover routine vision wellness, and you can and should build medical insurance when there's a medical diagnosis. Start with a patient. A good way to introduce the medical model is to start with a handout like this, which I won't go into great depth. It's on the Prima website. You can print it with your own office logo, and it explains to the patient that we may build vision plans, we may build medical plans, and it depends on your diagnosis. And the vision plans only cover routine wellness. Now, that's the easy part. The hard part is that patients might object, and the copay is often higher with medical insurance. Many times with vision plans, there's no copay. So that's a problem, and it's illegal to waive the copay. And you could use coordination of benefits, which we do on the copay, but that's not that easy anyway. Medical insurance may not cover the refraction, so the refraction may go back to the patient. And the big one is, and sometimes it's a factor and sometimes it's not a factor, is the deductible. But we do know with the changes in health care and the ACA, Obamacare, and, and just the general trend and cost of health care in general, deductibles are going up. And many, many companies are now using deductibles that are, you know, um, $1,500 a year, $2,000 a year. And in those cases, many patients are going to get the eye exam and everything coming back to them in full. I mean, so when you bill medical, it's a mistake to assume, oh, I'll just bill medical. 
and the patient won't know or care is not true. The patients care a lot, and we care a lot about keeping the patient's satisfaction at a high level and keeping the patient for life and not losing them over the insurance bill. And so we do need to be cautious with medical model. Your staff, in my opinion, you've got to tell the patient what you're doing. You really even, you need their approval. You might think you don't, and maybe you think you shouldn't have to, but they have a, you know, a financial stake in this as well. And they're going to, and, and so we care. Coordination of benefits, I won't get into it in great depth here, but with VSP and a little bit with IMED, you could bill medical first, keep the patient's copay on their, on their account. After the medical pays, then you could submit what wasn't covered, including the copay, to VSP for the refraction and the copay, and VSP will pay also. So you can coordinate benefits with medical and vision plans, not with Spectera or Davis. Here's a quick question, though, and it's a tough one for me, and it's making me really wrestle with the medical model, and, and uh, the vision plans will ask this as well. Does a patient have a right to use his vision plan benefits every year? And the vision plan contract is going to say they do have the right, and I kind of think they do too. If a patient has a vision plan through their employer, we should help them use it once a year, and not just for glasses. Maybe use it up with coordination of benefits on the medical, or you know, maybe we see the patient enough times if they are medical that one of their three visits a year, we can make it a routine refractive visit and update glasses or contacts. But I do think the patient need, has a right to use their, their plan. And so at some point, we need to help them use it. After pushing the medical model in my own practice very hard for, for two years, we got kind of tired of the fight. We had unhappy patients due to deductibles. In many cases, it was a lot of bother for us to try to determine the deductible. The deductible was big, was like a deal breaker for us. If it was going to go to the patient's deductible, we wanted to know about it. And so, you know, we would spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And it's, there's not an easy way. There's some websites we could go to and try to find the deductible, but it often wasn't accurate. And so we struggled with that. And and if it's going to go to their deductible, the, pa the patient's probably going to be unhappy. We end up now pre preferring to build to the insurance type the patient wants, which is usually the vision plan first, and reappoint for medical testing and follow-up medical care. There is a huge gray area in the medical diagnosis. Uh, and, and so in, in that we can probably find a medical diagnosis on most patients, but maybe the intent of their visit was routine. So just be careful, especially when deductibles are in play. Okay, moving through our 14 re, uh, ways to increase profits. Raise your fees for everything, for exams, for contact lens fitting, for contact lens products, for frame markups, for eyeglass lenses, for everything. Raise your fees. And if you think, well, it won't make any difference anyway because I have so many vision plans, then why don't you raise them? If it's not going to hurt anything, what's stopping you? the very worst, your practice will have a better reputation because your fees are higher. So I would, here's the reason why you should still raise them, even with vision plans. It's because people still buy things that aren't covered. Actually, quite a lot. Maybe an exam that's, out of, that's not covered, it's out of sequence. Maybe an extra pair of glasses. Maybe a pair of sunglasses. What, maybe what, many times, contact lenses. So let's go ahead and raise the fees. You know, I thought you were worth it. I thought you were objecting to the low fees that you're paid by vision plans, yet many optometrists are charging after their time of service discount or their S codes, they're charging very low prices for eye exams. And I'd say push them, raise them. Most fees are too low. Prescribe more contacts. Many vision plans still give an allowance toward contacts, and when they do that, your fee will make a big difference. You have to give a 15% discount, but you're so just raise your fee more and and get a, a better uh, and get get more profit out of contact lenses. We include corneal topography and we require it every year. It lets us charge a higher contact lens evaluation fee. So raise those. It's perfectly fine for me to share my practice fees with you. They're on the Prima website if you want to check them. Higher frame markups. Well, this is a big one. 
because any way that we can legally charge the vision plan patient more out of pocket, we need to do it. We're limited in how, we, how well we can do it, how often we can do it, but frame overage is one way. And a lot of practices have three times markups, but I'm more liking to see a sliding scale of three to four times your wholesale cost. By the way, we always mean the cost as shown in the frames data book, not what you actually pay. You actually do better than that. You probably get 10 or 20% on your frame vendors and maybe even a rebate through Prima. So you're, you should be doing quite a bit better. But we use the frame book price, and I'd like to see you be at least three to four times on the bulk of your frames. We do need to see a nice supply of budget frames, and budget frames has a different markup formula. They're not three to four times. If you buy a frame from a supplier, you know, like New York Eye or Modern Optical, low priced, maybe you spend $5 or $10 on these low priced frames. Well, you can't mark them up three or four times. If you've spent $5, you're not going to sell it for $20. We need to sell it for like $110. So the markups on budget frames and closeout frames are quite a bit higher. You could just lump them into a, a fixed price. Like we have some frames that started in the maybe in the $90 range, then we go to the 120, then the 150 and 180, and we just sort of bulk them in there. But we're only paying you know somewhere between $5 and $20 for those lower priced frames. Okay, so understand, and if you don't understand it, I'm going to give you a quick course here, but understand how we achieve um, frame overages. How, how VSP pricing works with WFA, that's wholesale frame allowance, and RFA, retail frame allowance. And basically, here's how it works. You look at wholesale frame allowance first, and it's printed on the patient's benefit sheet. And um, if the wholesale cost of the frame is, is less than the WFA, wholesale frame allowance, it's covered. And there is no overage. It's covered completely. You're going to get the cost plus a dispensing fee, and that's all. So we don't really want those frames. I don't want you to carry very many frames that are under the WFA. How do you know what is the WFA? You have to look at a bunch of your patients. It's probably around $55. But look at your own patients and the benefit sheet and keep track of them and find out what's the most common and, you know, wh where is the WFA. And don't buy many frames that have a frames book price under that. And that way we move, most of the time, we move you to the RFA. Okay. You also might consider a more aggressive markup. We have so many vision plans in my practice, it's probably 90% vision plan, except for medical, which we see a lot of, but of the others. And so my frame markups are four to five times because we get more overage. Now, I do have a nice supply of budget frames, closeout frames. Prima is doing this uh, direct buy from China, which should be in, in August, by the way. And... Um, and so and it, 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 we're getting a lot of low price frames, and that way I have a nice selection in that lower price point. When we do that aggressive markup of four to five times, every patient without a vision plan is handed this nice coupon when they walk in. There's a stack of them on the front desk. They may not be combined with vision plans or other discounts, but every pay, private pay patient or Medicare patient feels like they got a bargain, and I need them to see this because our, our frame prices on the board are pretty high. Okay, moving on. Multiple pairs of glasses. It's huge with vision plans because we make a nice profit on the second pair. Are you doing a lot of multiple pairs? Consider doing the thing I've been doing for years, which is mm, the second complete pair and the third and fourth are all 50% off. Not 50% off the frame or 50% off the lenses, off the complete pair. We even sometimes go through bonus programs where we'll spiff the optician $10 for a multiple pair sale, and it makes a difference. I know spiffs aren't all that popular, but they actually do work and maybe work better than the feel-good bonus program where we just, you know, have a pool of money that we always seem to hit the goal and then we divide it up among staff. This one, they really do try, and so uh, we go on and off it, but it's a good thing to try. Join VSP Premier. I'm running uh, on to 40 minutes here. I've got about five minutes left, but I'm running a little long. Okay, it's okay. We'll get through this. This is good. VSP Premier is widely disliked. 
I get that. And I get that it just sort of hits you wrong that they would leverage, you know, their their other products and force you into buying them. And maybe on principle alone you can't do it. But I'll tell you, unfortunately, I hate to tell you this, but it does make a difference in the number of patients you see. We've been VSP Premier for a couple of years, and we hear all the time how they saw us on the website, and that doctor locator website, by the way, gets around 10 million visits a year. And when you have a big, bold banner showing on there, as opposed to just a, the name and address, it makes a difference. And it says Premier, VSP Premier Practice. I mean, patients are drawn to it, I have to say. Uh, I would say if you're close to meeting the requirements anyway, and you know they're they're not that hard. And Marshawn and Altair happen to not be that bad of frame companies. They're actually good frame companies, and we've used Marshawn way before they were owned by VSP. And Altair, which I you know in principle don't like to use VSP products, but I got to tell you, they're they're put them on your board at no charge. They're on consignment. I love having an extra hundred frames I didn't pay for. And they're good brands. BB, Tommy Bahama, and they're good quality. I didn't pay for them until I sold them. I mean, really, I, I hate to say I would do it, but I am in it for the business reason. Maybe you're, maybe you're better than me, but I'm telling you, I got to do what's good for the practice. So it's not that hard to meet their premium requirements for most practices. It might be for some. And if it's, yeah, I wouldn't stretch real hard, but if I'd stretch a little because the uh, the benefits are big. Okay, moving quickly through the last few here. Eyeglass warranties. My my sample is on the Prima website. We sell it for $37. It's a bumper to bumper two year warranty. Um, we sell it like an extended warranty at Best Buy and we sell a lot of them. And um, we might give it away to private pay patients and just say as a courtesy for your business we're going to include this at no charge but it's still get they get the document and it says thirty seven dollars and that's what we charge and um, a, a, it includes a, a lot shipping and handling even under warranty we charge a shipping and handling and it and I'm telling you that just because the frame vendor or the lab is covering the cost it's not free and there probably is shipping and who's paying for it? So when the patients come back in for a scratch remake or a frame breakage that's under warranty and you're going to go ahead and give it to them, I would charge them a $15 shipping and handling and say, Mrs. Smith, I'm happy to tell you the glasses are covered. We're going to make you a new pair. It's no charge. There's $15 shipping and handling. Nobody complains. But I'll tell you, when I look at my monthly production report under shipping and handling, the number is big. There's a lot of money there. We charge a patient's own frame fee. If they don't want to buy a new frame, only when allowed, and VSP does not allow it, which we honor, but if the there's no rule against it, and for private pay patients as well, we charge a $25 uh, frame service fee to reuse a patient's frame. These are things, I mean, we maybe wish we didn't have to do it, but it does, these things do, do help us generate more profit. We have special recall messages that go out through our um, solutions reach email um, solution reach email um, recall notices and postcard and we have one like this for VSP and one for IMED and we run a separate search and we code our patient recalls when we know so that we know they're on that plan hopefully you could separate those in your computer system but I'll tell you when the patient gets a recall reminder that says the exams covered they just call and schedule I mean they're coming and we help them remember their benefits. Finally, recommend, uh, oh, no, I'm only 14, not 12. Recommend the best. Don't offer all the options. Your, your opticians are probably offering too many progressives, too many ARs, too many choices. Uh, with vision plans especially, pick the highest level that gives you the most profit, and that's the one you sell. If the patient says that's really high or my copay is really high for that and very few will because they're getting a great deal in your practice so but when they do then we can offer them a lower price product you do have to if they ask for it offer them the lower price products but most patients don't ask and they go with our first recommendation and we don't 
we don't offer options. We just offer the best. We do in-office edging, depending on your volume, and I can help you talk. I'll talk with you about that. But if you're doing decent volume, it's a way to increase your profit with vision plans. The VSP in-office finishing program is quite profitable. I don't haven't looked at what we're making on it, but it seems like we might make ten or fifteen dollars on average for high index and progressives. If we're edging those, we're going to probably make twenty five dollars. I, I don't, you know, in that ballpark, it adds up. And uh, we have an edger anyway. We want to have an edger, and so so keep your cost of goods down and use those programs. And finally, we definitely want to be selling non-covered services and products. I mean, that's really the, one of the biggest ways, and I save it for last. But if you have a fair amount of vision plans, I would offer a photo retinal screening or an Optimap screening at a fee. It's a lot. We need to find ways for patients to pay for more of their services. And we say the vision plan covers a very basic eye exam, but we offer advanced technology in our practice. And for the patients who are interested in it, we don't force anybody but we have a very good success rate, depending on what your price point is. Uh, you, sh you know, without, and it depends on whether Optimap's being leveraged against dilation or not. I mean, that will greatly increase if you're going to imply that you won't have to dilate as often. We don't do that. We have an Optimap, and my doctors dilate 95% of their comprehensive exams. I mean, they they still want to see it dilated, and so. Um, you know, we don't get to leverage that, but we're still at probably at 60% um, acceptance rate, and probably about the same for macular pigment optical density. We offer both of them for a, a combo uh, value. If they put the two together, there's a little discount. We sell a ton of nutraceuticals, nutritional supplements, I promise, tons of them, it's cases and cases of them. And so there's a lot of revenue to pick up on these patients in other ways. We sell a lot of non-RX sunglasses, especially to contact lens wearers. But really, the pre we carry a big selection. It's a big investment. But the community has learned we have the best sunglasses. And they come in and buy them. And we do the other specialty areas, vision therapy, medical eye care. The, the, you know, this is getting access to the patient. Okay, I went uh, four minutes over by my clock. Not too bad. Uh, for as much content as I had in there. Hope I didn't go too fast for you. Uh, but I am ready to take any questions. And if Nathan is uh, uh, around, maybe he could uh, read a question for us. I am here. And as a reminder, you can use the questions tab. If any questions you may have. First question is, um, is, the billing, is billing the vision plan as a coordination of benefits um, for refraction combined with a medical visit considered using the vision plan? Oh, okay. Um, no. Uh, in my analysis, I wouldn't have selected that one because that I, I wouldn't select a coordination of benefits. Um, I suppose you want it to mirror your real world, but actually, you know, I'm getting paid from the medical plan, so if you were going to do that, I think it would only be fair to say that the medical fees should be lumped in there. So in answer to your question, I didn't do that in my analysis, and I don't think I would. I think I would keep coordination of benefits out of that analysis. Okay. And uh, how often do you recognize, re recognize, recommend people raise their fees? Would would be an annual thing or more yeah. or less often? I think generally annually, and it depends on how much we are raising them. Um, you should, you know, I, I sometimes get asked and I look at doctors' fees and I'll say, we should really raise fees. And, um, you know, the doctor might say, well, let's, you know, raise them, you know, $5.00. But if you're only charging $80 for an eye exam, you're way too low. And you could easily raise them. You could have a 50% increase in that fee and charge $120, and no one would notice. Because you're still within the norm of what an eye exam value is. So, so I, I think we, you know, in answer to the question, small increases should probably come yearly, at least on some areas. Maybe it's on lenses, ophthalmic lenses which we're not typically marking up, but we're pricing them on what the traffic will bear. And if your lab costs have increased, you need to kind of bump those up a little bit. If you're way under what the norms are, then we need to kind of clean house and have a really big jump. By the way, you'll do it and no one will notice. <laughs> you know, your, your staff will be very worried and you'll say, we're going to do it anyway. 
and you come back the next week to the staff meeting and say, well, how did it all go with raising the fees? And they kind of look at each other and they say, oh, yeah, I forgot we raised the fees. Nobody noticed. Nobody said anything. That's what I run into. And so, so we, even if it's a fairly big increase, uh, you know, you might have to do that once, and then you just kind of keep it in line on a yearly basis. Okay. Uh, coming back to the question on coordination of benefits, maybe not. Uh, the question is less about analyzing the vision plans and more about if you, if someone comes in and uses their their vision plan benefit for an eye exam and there's coordination of benefits, is that still going to count as their once a year vision? Yes. Uh, screening? Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. I get the question. Yeah, that's going to ca- count as their benefit. They're going to use their benefit up uh, by by using any coordination of benefits. Correct. Okay. And now, you know, of, for their exam benefit, they'd still have their eyeglass benefit unless they used that up. But that's not that's not really in the in the picture here. We're just talking mostly about the exam benefit. And VSP, for example, in coordination of benefits, will pay up to their normal exam fee for your practice and for your state. And so, you know, if they normally would pay seventy dollars for an eye exam, and you know, that's what your typical exam fee is then VSP will pay up to $70 in coordination of benefits towards the refraction, the copay, and even towards the deductible, whatever might be left over there. Um, anything that the medical didn't cover in that, in that range. I have some good documents on the Prima website in the m- member-only resource page. And uh, if you can't find them there, I can email them to you. Some good like uh, uh, instruction sheets on how to do coordination of benefits. But really, it's on the VSP uh, provider manual, and I urge you to get familiar with it. Log on to affinity.com, click on VSP online, find the signature VSP manual, and there's a section on coordination of benefits that tell you just how to do it. Same with IMED as well. So so it's, it's on there. All right, we'll take no other questions at this time. We'll take a minute. Anyone else who has questions, please do type it in. Okay. Very good. We may not have too many tonight. That's perfectly fine. I do know the uh, um, baseball all-star game is on tonight, so if you're, I apologize. When we start, we chose this date. We didn't realize it was all-star game. I, I'm recording it, so I'm going to go watch it when we're done. But uh, so I'm sorry if there's baseball fans out there. Well, there are no more questions. If you oh, <laughs> one right under the gun, Doctor Vernon. Um, All right. Well, your your sense of the best division plans on a profitability sense, just maybe short ranking list of which ones are better, which ones are worse. Yes. I think VSP and IMED are neck and neck. I don't think that the dollar difference on my on my fees that I on my profitability that I showed there are that significant. I don't think that, you know, we, the data is not significantly different. Uh, so I put IMED and VSP pretty much neck and neck, and I think those two are the best. I think um, then I'd say Davis is – Davis and Spectera are also – fairly neck and neck and not very good. You'll, you'll be frustrated by them if you don't take them now. Part of the, about whether you should take them or not is, are they in your area? I mean, if there's hardly anybody that has those in, in some parts of the country, then that, that don't bother. There, you know, there's not enough to bother with. But I would ask your front desk staff, what do patients ask about when they call? You know, what are you hearing? Because it can change from one year to the next. Some big employer might have picked up or switched over to Davis, maybe you don't even know it. You know, so so you know, ask your staff what people are asking, and that would guide me to what to take. Okay, um, I'm not sure I follow this question, so I'm going to read it exactly and see if you can. If the medical billing applies all allowable to the deductible, can you then build a vision plan for the exam, or is it considered double dipping? Okay, um, so double, I think it's double dipping. If you used coordination of benefits, you don't have any benefits left to build a vision exam. You're, you're coordinating that eye exam benefit with the medical, and you got paid pretty well because the medical paid you what they paid, and then VSP paid you on top of that. Uh, so um, there wouldn't be anything left. In general, 
I am a little worried about double dipping. And if you're going to build, I'm very careful about building the meta, unless you're using coordination of benefits, which is telling the vision plan what you've already built medical for. That's different. But if you're going to try to build like the refraction to one to a vision plan and the medical visit and maybe the photographs to the medical plan, I prefer, I don't like doing those on the same day. I know that technically some of the billing and coding experts say you can do it, but I think it's risky. I, I would I would reappoint for medical. I think we need to get a little more comfortable with reappointing. We're kind, we tend to, and I tend to, and my doctors in my practice especially tend to, you know, want to do everything the first day. I don't think we have to do that. I think we need to break away from that and say the routine vision exam is going to cover most of you, you know, what we need to do, but I'm going to need to have you come back for a follow-up for the photos or the fields or whatever. Now, we do know, however, I wish it wasn't this way, but vision plans in the contract, you've agreed to dilate under vision plans. So you can't just reappoint them to dilate because dilation is included in all vision plans, and, and you've agreed to that. However, you could defer dilation if you're having them back anyway. I, you know, I'll leave that to you. I will say that it's not a good strategy to have people back for visits that aren't needed. The patient will see through it. Your reputation will be hurt by it. So, uh, and, and so I, I would say you've got to follow your conscience and follow good clinical guidelines. And I admit that in the real world, sometimes that means you saw a patient, you build their vision plan, and you gave them a, some advice about their dry eye or some advice about their allergy because you didn't really need to have them back. And to force it would be so obviously that you're just doing it to build them insurance for it. It could have been done. Don't go down that road would be my advice. That, that was a little off topic. I don't think the question was asking me that, but I, uh, I, I wanted to share that. All right, and, and staying a little off topic on, on the subject of picking up profitability by in-house finishing, um, how do you assess the practice's readiness for a new edger and, and how they, they calculate you know, their, their ROI and how much should they be spending on an edger? You know, I use the rule of thumb that if you're doing five pairs of glasses a day, that's about my rule of thumb. You should get an edger. If you're selling five pairs of glasses, let's say five pairs that you could make, either through VSP or private pay. I mean, if it's going to be, I don't count Davis or Spectera glasses or that, but maybe, you know, if you can average five pairs a day, five days a week, that's what I think. It's a rough rule of thumb because edgers are pretty expensive. I have a Santinelli. Santinelli's a good prima vendor, very high quality machines. The, the rep can show anybody on your staff how to cut lenses, edge lenses beautifully. It's very easy, very fast. We can save a lot of money. You can cut your cost of goods. You can improve your delivery time. There's a lot of good things. You can stock lenses with Crizal, I mean, single vision. I mean, you can you can do very nice with it. Um, so, but I, but but it's a big investment, and 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 that's a rough rule of thumb. You can also just do projections. I mean, uh, look at your lab bills and oh, over a period of a month or so, and jot down how much savings you would have generated if you could have done the work, if you could have bought stock lenses instead of having the lab make them, and and if instead of the lab edging them, you edge them. So you'd have to do a little bit of projection work, but. Uh, you know, you could then figure out by the savings, can you meet the monthly payment for the edger? I don't know what that would be, but if you were leasing an edger, maybe 500 bucks a month, you know, ballpark, can you save that much in your lab bill is what I'd be asking. Yes, there are some additional costs. If we're going to do a lab analysis, I'm getting way off topic, but there are material costs and, you know, rent and staff and those things, but some of that, you know, is there anyway. I mean, it's marginal costs. Even your staff, you know, to have, there's probably downtime that some of your staff could make better use of and could do edging, uh, you know, during some of the downtime. So that's what I, that's how my thinking is on that. Anything else, Nathan? I think that is going to do it for tonight. All righty. Very good. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming and, uh, and let me know if I can help by email anytime. 
Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great evening. And this will be posted on the website in the next couple of days. Enjoy the All-Star game. Uh, thanks. Bye.